thanks everybody for joining us. Um, this is Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund investment team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. As you know, Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in food and ag. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, and this month's theme is Precision Ag. And on today's call, we are fortunate to be joined by Mitchell Hora, the CEO of Continuum Ag. Continuum Ag software imports soil data from many different sources and converts to universal format so that it can then benchmark metrics such as nutrients, organic matter, and CO2 for different geographies, soil types, and cropping systems. Not only does this capability quantify soil health, it IDs soil health drivers and gives Continuum Ag an ability to offer growers a high confidence roadmap to soil improvement. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Continuum Ag's market. You are potential customers uh, for their products and services. You built a similar company, or you are a sophisticated business per person or ag professional who understands their market and the challenges and opportunities that they may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. A few process comments while the poll is running. We are not soliciting investment in any way whatsoever. Secondly, you are all on mute. However, you can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. And there will be a dedicated Q&A section at the end of the, the, the presentation. And finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Mitchell from Continuum Ag. Take it away, Mitchell. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, everyone. And uh, I think, yeah, fitting, uh, fitting uh, venue here for me on my side here today that I am in the tractor planting soybeans. And I'll show you guys just really briefly here. It's noisy outside. so. Won't take a lot of time, but but we are planting soybeans into some cereal rye here right now. Um, we are in southeast Iowa, and uh, perfect day to be planting down into some of the cereal rye here. Looks really awesome. This was drilled in last fall after we harvested corn. Get back in out of the wind. So, as in my, my intro, um, like I said, my name is Mitchell Hora. I'm a seventh generation farmer here in Washington County, Iowa, southeast Iowa. And uh, my family farm is about 700 acres. As part of this soil health and precision ag conversation, you know, it really is near and dear to my family, near and dear to me. Uh, we started no tilling over 40 years ago. And now, this is our sixth year using cover crops. And what we found is that as we're adopting things like no-till and now with cover crops and part of these soybeans I'm planting today are part of a relay crop. We're doing diverse interseed the cover crops and wide diversity to our cropping systems now. As you implement these regenerative practices, uh, you have to change a lot of a lot of systems. Yeah, it's a complete paradigm shift to the way that we're farming. And uh, we are shifting our system from being very biologically driven to being or to, from shifting it from being chemically driven to now being very biologically driven. And farmers need a better understanding of how that process actually works and how do they change their mindset? How do they better understand the soil? Where we look at it at Continuum Ag, we're looking at the soil as a living dynamic continuum where with most of the industry today really views the soil as a dead static growing medium. And yeah, keep uh, we can keep kind of shifting through the slides here. This is my dad that I farm with and uh, some of our big cover crops there. This is exactly what I'm doing here today, you know, planting soybeans into a cereal rye cover crop. Um, I mentioned relay cropping. We're actually going to harvest some of this, the uh, rye that I'm planting here today, or the, we're going to harvest the rye. And then in the, the fall, we will actually harvest the soybeans as well. But we're planting the beans today. We will harvest the rye over the top of the soybeans, utilize the rye seed for our own cover crop uses, and then come back and harvest the grain crop later. 
We do the same type of thing with wheat, which is what this picture is here now. There's a wide array of different cover crops that farmers can use. It's really taken off here in Iowa and uh, continues to take off around the country and, and around the world. Keeping the soil covered and keeping living roots at all times are part of the soil health principles. That's a really key thing we have to help farmers to continue to implement as they have more of a push for, uh, for regenerative ag. I saw a uh, <laughs> message coming in there that we could turn the rye into whiskey. This rye hasn't been turned into whiskey, but we did have some barley that we grew last year that went into a malting facility. So don't quite have the whiskey yet, but uh, we're helping on the beer side of things to start out. Next slide. This is what it looks like for planting corn. Um, we already have, we're about, uh, about two thirds of the way done planting corn. All of it got planted just like this. Everything gets planted green. Dad is terminating some of that cover crop right now. Uh, so we've planted corn into a rye, wheat, and hairy vetch blend. And now we're terminating it with a herbicide. These soybeans that we're planting now are going into cover crop that's 10 to 12 inches tall on average. We won't terminate this cover crop for another five weeks. Um, and then even longer on the stuff that we're actually going to harvest. Really letting these systems to work and better, un, better you know, utilize taxpayer dollars, utilize our own dollars as family farmers, that if we're going to spend money on things like cover crops and regenerative ag, it really needs to pay. So that brings me to, I think, now we get into continuum ag, what we actually do. Well, these are the soil health principles. You know, the, a key thing for me is, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, utilizing my family farm legacy where we can practice what we preach. It's been a huge piece of our success and being able to really become a thought leader and an influencer in the space because we're, we're doing it. And <laughs> today's a great example of, you know, working from my second office here being the cab of the track. Okay. So a quick little, um, pitch on, on Continuum Ag, some of the things that we're doing. I started Continuum Ag a little over five years ago. Uh, today, our business footprint is 40 states and 12 countries. Our total team is up to 16 people now. I started the company doing crop consulting. I, my degrees are from Iowa State in agronomy and ag system technology. I wanted to be back involved in the family farm and helping other farmers here in Southeast Iowa. So I started a consulting company. We were using the Haney Soil Health Test to better understand quantifying soil health and being able to start putting some numbers behind these things that we were doing as we were implementing this biological system. We can hit the next one. As we were implementing, we were finding that, okay, this is really working. We were helping and better understanding our own family farm, helping to understand the farmers, the customers that I was working with, but we needed better data tools to be able to manage all this info. We actually built the largest private Haney soil health data set, and we needed better tools to be able to manage all of it. Uh, we needed to make sure that we were protecting all this data though too. Haney testing or other soil health tools, it can get pretty expensive. And now carbon testing we're finding is uh, really adds up in the cost as well. We have to protect that data. So uh, instead of building into somebody else's platform, we decided to build our own. Next. So what we're doing is we have to be able to ensure that as part of our data tools, which now we call topsoil, we have to implement data that helps to de-risk adopting regenerative ag systems. We have to ensure that we're protecting yield or protecting the farmer's bottom line, but that we're also helping them to be able to really utilize the data. How do we create action off of the data? There's so many new technologies and data tools and farmers are just bombarded with data. They don't wanna sit down and, and play with stuff all day. They just need to know what to do. They need that final ending result. How we think about the data that we deliver is it gets that farmer 95% of the way there. All they have to do is tweak it and they utilize their local agronomist to tweak the recommendations that we provide for that case-by-case -case basis and the nuances of every single individual farm because every farm is different, but we get 95% of the way there in making that decision. And uh, so now the platform's up over 150,000 acres. It's been live for right at a year. Uh, we launched it last spring. We have over 700 farmers in the platform. Uh, last year, we did um, about 165,000 in revenue. Uh, we're well over that already uh, year to date here this year. So really continuing to expand 
um, and helping farmers to just better understand getting their data into a platform, integrate with other technologies, and helping them to be able to make decisions like managing fertility, understanding how to put together a cover crop blend, understanding how to change your herbicide program, your fertility program, your planting program as you implement these conservation systems. Go next. So as I mentioned, this is all housed within our Topsoil tool. It's an online data platform um, at topsoil.ag. We utilize machine learning to tie in a variety of government and private data sources, integrating through APIs with other soil labs, uh, with other technology companies to really make that data in the back end seamless, layer all of these informations in one, uh, in one spot. Farmer can log into it from their phone, iPad, computer, whatever. Um, there's no app or nothing at this point. Um, so it's just web-based and, and colorblind. You know, number one is creating the actual actionable item in terms of fertility management. The map that you see there, I believe is a potassium map. Uh, the fertilizer spreader was out in this field here earlier when I started planting it today. Uh, we're making variable rate fertility recommendations as step number one. That allows the farmer to put some dollars in their pocket, save a little bit on synthetic fertilizer, better factor in biology into that equation, and uh, start implementing these precision ag systems and improving soil health because now we're not over fertilizing. Uh, as we start to change the system, we have to document that sustainability journey. All these companies and consumer, the government now becoming really interested in where the food comes from, that transparent sustainability story. Since we're already collecting 90% of the data or 95% of the data that's needed, for carbon markets or other sustainability initiatives, we're saying, okay, farmer, you're already working with us. We already have most of your data that you need. If you would like to participate in a carbon market, we can make that super simple for you. Collect the last remaining data components that we need. And then at the click of a button, allow that farmer to share with any of our, um, of our partners that they wish to. The farmer is negotiating the contract with the sustainability initiative or ecosystem service market of their choice. When they sign the contract and then allow us to share the data, then we just um, share that along via our output APIs. O overall, allowing farmers to monetize soil health, connecting in with these programs. Today, if a farmer enrolls in, in one of these programs, it take, there's so much uncertainty here. It's the wild west for sure. I've had some of my farmer customers enroll in today's current carbon markets. And it, they've spent upwards of 60 hours to enroll and to gather all their data. We're working on getting that down under 60 minutes. Next. This is our overall business model. Um, so looking at, you know, from the current ag infrastructure being the roots of this tree, those farmers, they're utilizing their current consulting, utilizing their agronomist that's already local, already boots on the ground, already has the relationship, already has most of the data. We work with those guys on a simple subscription basis. Collect all the data, they can access our soil health data tools or other precision ag, access sensors, access other um, remote data if they want to, imagery and whatnot, um, whatever they need to help them to better make decisions. Get all that data in one spot into topsoil and now help to link them up the supply chain to sustainability driven companies and sustainability initiatives, ecosystem markets, and ultimately, to the end consumer. Those companies up the supply chain, they also subscribe into the platform to be able to create those APIs and basically you know, advertise and solicit to our grower network um, of farmers around the world. Um, just making it easier and more streamlined really to be able to make these connections coming to and, and off the farm. Next. Um, I won't dwell on this. I mean, all you guys have seen some of these different market opportunities on, on how big some of these markets can be. A big one that we're really pushing on is, is those farmers that are implementing these regenerative systems. It's a huge, huge um, you know, concern. It's, it's a lot of risk when you're changing practices. Our consultants in our network are their independent crop consultants. Um, they're basically just channel partners for us same type of thing that we do with our farmers directly. We work with other consultants around the country and allow them access to the data tools. Our primary customer are those farmers that are adding cover crops, that are reducing tillage, that are reducing their synthetic inputs and going to more of a biological system. 
exactly like my family farm um, is doing and has been for the last couple of years. In Iowa, the goal for the nutrient reduction strategy is 12 and a half million acres. We're getting close to 2 million acres right now, uh, but just in Iowa alone, uh, massive opportunity. Right now across the country, there's a little bit more than 20 million acres of cover crops. Those numbers are supposed to go over 50 million by 2024. So really rapid expansion. And uh, as you drive the countryside, um, especially here in Iowa, the number of cover crop acres is really, really taken off. Next. Um, so just a couple of things. I don't want to dwell on this too terrible much, but we've really focused on, you know, marketing, on, on being a thought leader in the space, utilizing my own social media stuff, especially this time of the year, really trying to post, uh, you know, getting questions all the time on how do I, turn, you know, what do I do about terminating my cover crop? What's the nutrient impact of the cover crop? Am I getting the nutrient credit? Am I tying up nutrients? Um, how do I change my planting rates? How do I, how do I set up my planter to plant into this stuff? So many questions. Uh, I've got a podcast that I put on with American Public Media uh, that's called Fieldwork. We highlight a lot of things on that. The Minnesota Millennial Farmer is my co-host of it. Um, we're a, a variety of like our consultants in the network are the key influencers in the space. People like Rick Clark, Russell Hedrick, uh, Jeremiah Durbin, these guys that are leaders in the space, those are the people that we are working with. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, being a thought leader and farmer myself, really been able to work well within that network. Uh, we'll have a big field day here on June 7th. You got, you're all invited if you want to come to Iowa and check out some more stuff for yourself. Uh, we'll have a couple hundred people here, which will be a lot of fun. Next. Um, I don't need to dwell on this. I mean, you guys are seeing some of the other companies in this uh, with all these different groups on here. They're all looking at being able to, to, you know, connect farmers with marketing opportunities. We are working with some of these companies already. We see them more so as uh, collaborators versus um, competitors, uh, where really our key thing is better understanding how to actually implement on the farm. That's a huge missing piece. The, the, educational component of this is massive. There's such a learning curve that has to be um, undertaken. And, and as farmers, we really understand how to have those, have those, uh, that, that message. The big thing that we're really building out right now is on the software side of things. We've built a heck of a lot. Um, we've raised a little bit of venture capital to help us to fund that, but we definitely still have a long way to go. Being very lean, being very specific, um, really cost-minded, when it comes to building out software solutions. But like I said, we've uh, had things launched uh, for about a year um, and we've had revenue for the last six years now. So driving, um, you know, driving that um, and really helping to drive that return on investment from the farmer. Next. Um, I don't need to, to dwell on the team and stuff, but like I said, 16 uh, spread out all over the country, but very heavy farm. Um, farm managed, farmer focused. My business partner and I are both farmers. My COO, Brad, is a farmer from Iowa as well. Uh, Carolyn comes from a family farm also. Cows Tube was PhD at the University of Illinois, taught there for 15 years in the ag space. So very, very heavily ag focused. It's been huge. And, um, you know, as we're looking at rolling out technology in the ag space, being a customer of our own solutions has been, um, that's been priceless. Next. You know, what we don't have within our own team, utilizing advisors, Dr. L Dr. Liz Haney, um, who along with her husband built the, built or developed the soil health test. Um, they're huge helps. Uh, Christoph Jospe, a lot of you probably know Christoph. He uh, was one of the founders of Nori. Uh, we went through the Ag Launch Accelerator program together and roomed together uh, for the five weeks we were in Memphis. Uh, Christoph and I are buddies and, and he's still helping in a advisory role with us here now. Um, but uh, tied in, you know, with some of the ag startup um, systems here in Iowa, including Ag Ventures Alliance, Ag Startup Engine, mentioned Ag Launch. We went through the plug and play accelerator as well. So, you know, as a young person in this and first time entrepreneur, you know, where started the company, just bootstrapping consulting company, you know, really small business, not necessarily tech and scalable company to now going after venture capital, um, I really needed to better understand the dynamics between 
bootstrapping and consulting a service company now looking at a more scalable investor uh, investable company that can can really go and, and scale so um, utilizing the advisors is, is just huge next um last couple things you know uh pretty cool you know uh, a couple pilot project stuff we have going on right now it's just really interesting to see how many people are throwing their hat in the carbon space we've always been a soil health company focus on the, the Haney test and focus on helping farmers to actually implement. Well, now carbon markets are the hot thing. We're finding ourselves right in the middle of all of that. Um, I'm one of two farmers that's on the working group for the Climate Action Reserve um, and their, uh, their carbon registry. So very well versed on that side of things. Um, I won Indigo Ag's Carbon Cup for being the farmer in Iowa with the most carbon already stored in my soil um, as part of already um, having implemented these practices um, and now, you know, helping with a variety of pilot projects and um, some companies that have not yet announced that they're in the carbon space. Um, in the platform today, we have farmers in there from 27 states and 12 countries. Um, I was on the ag grad 30 under 30 list here for their second cohort here just this year. All kinds of different media awareness and stuff too. I mean, as you guys have seen, this space is is really been able to come to the forefront as part of now a solution where farmers have always been looked to as, as part of the problem. Now we still have a long way to go to be able to reverse the issues that we've caused, um, but really, um, really encouraging to see farmers come to the forefront of being the solution for more than just providing the feed, fuel, and fiber for the world. Next. Um, you know, like I said, so started 2015 while at Iowa State, um, we built the largest, uh, largest data set, a um, couple of different um, accelerator programs. Uh, we did a pre-seed round last year, I'm doing a bridge round right now that's getting all closed out and stuff. We'll see what the, what the future is going to be. Um, but it's really, to me, it's been about um, building smart, building based on what our customers need. And, um, and then funding it appropriately for what we need to build. Um, so being very strategic about that. All right, next. Um, here's all my contact info. And uh, I think it was pretty dang close to my 15 to 20 minutes that I was um, allotted. So happy to answer some questions. And, uh, and if not, I'll keep, <laughs> keep on planting my soybeans here today. But appreciate everyone being on. Mitchell, thanks so much. This is uh, by far the most um, interactive, might not be the best word, but we've never seen somebody in the field. Let me, let me, let me <laughs> say that much. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good to see you multitasking. Um, and uh, now we'll, we'll open it up for questions. You know, I'm, I'm happy you put your contact info there. Um, you know, we have a diverse crew of people on the call today, and this gets dispersed to an even, even more diverse crew. Uh, within the ag and food industry. How can uh, those listening now and those listening uh, post facto help you out? Um, I think, you know, we want to just continue to build out awareness that there are resources out here for farmers, uh, that there is real solutions here for these problems, that there are people that are willing and ready to help, uh, that we can actually solve these issues, and that farmers can really be part of the solution. The future is extremely bright. Now, part of what needs to be pushed on though is how we are looking at some of these um, solutions or how we are approaching some of these markets stuff is actually wrong, okay? So one of the big things I'm pushing on is additionality is being looked at wrong right now in the way that these carbon markets are, are, are um, trying to define it. And uh, they, um, where th what I'm getting at is we copied and pasted a little bit too much when these registries were written that additionality in agriculture is not a one time change. It's not a here's what you were doing, here's what you're doing now, one time definitive change, and you were losing carbon and now you're sequestering carbon. That's not how it works in agriculture. In ag, it's every year we're planting that cover crop blend, every year we're choosing that tillage practice, every year. We're making X number of passes across the field. We're making X amount of nutrient input 
And every single one of those decisions has a carbon footprint to it. Now we need to have a, okay, you're going to do cover copy. You're going to do no till you can't be flip flopping back and forth. You defeat the purpose. We have to be able to have some of that permanence. We have to be able to have that decision to change and to stick with it. But the every single year that carbon impact is different and we need to be looking at what is the net annual carbon footprint of each individual farm and paying farmers based on that these uh, carbon programs today are really more so cost share for practice change we really need to better understand the actual carbon footprint of the decisions that we're making and better um, reward farmers um, based on their actual impact, um, not just what boxes can you check that you weren't checking before, but let's really utilize tech and utilize data and utilize you know, the startup community within agriculture and the people that we have within agriculture to better understand truly providing for the solution here. Awesome, thank you. Um, I forgot to mention to those on the call, uh, would love to hear your input now. If you want to raise your hand, I can unmute you or feel free to type a question into the Q&A pane um, or to the chat pane. Uh, looks like Nell Clemens has done just that. Nell asks, given you have been doing this for many years, will you qualify for carbon credits in a marketplace or does it nope. have to be incremental? Also, nope. great. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, maybe answer yeah. that question. Then I'll go on the second part. Perfect. Yeah. So no, we don't qualify today. Um, we had looked at, you know, being able to potentially grandfather some of it in with Nori um, and their look back period. Um, but just so many of these groups too, it's um, we've uh, I've gone through the actual, you know, initial signup program now for uh, Nori Indigo, the Swollen Water Outcomes Fund, uh, FBN. Um, I think I'm missing a couple others too, um, that we've gone through some of the initial onboarding and, and, uh, played around with a, an array of these different tools have not fully enrolled in any of them. Um, at this point, you know, how they're looking at additionality for our farm, it wouldn't make it worth it. You know, I, I can't spend dozens and dozens of hours enrolling and, and doing all the data collection and stuff for maybe a couple dollars an acre, because what we would be able to qualify for, um, with additionality today would hardly trigger anything. But I have data looking at the organic matter on my farm and looking at more traditional means of measuring um, organic material and a part of that being carbon. Some of the data that I've got shows that we've improved our organic matter by 1.4% over the last 10 years. Okay, so 1.4% increased organic matter. We've gone from 3.9% organic matter to 5.3% in 10 years which is really amazing. And uh, if you translate that directly to carbon in the top six inches, we would be sequestering an equivalent of over four and a half tons per acre per year. Now, when stratified down to a meter, we're definitely not doing that much, maybe somewhere between two and three tons. I don't, I don't know if, there, if that data exists today to help me to better understand the stratification between the sequestration in the upper portion of the soil stratified down to a meter. Um, but point being is we are we know that we're sequestering gobs and gobs of carbon we've been able to increase our water infiltration rate to now four inches of infiltration in less than five minutes we've reduced our synthetic fertilizer by 45 percent across the board we've reduced our pesticides by up to 75 percent still maintaining the record yields and driving profitability uh, but that story is not able to be documented and be utilized by these people who want that story and want to use us and want to use our story to help them to meet their sustainability goals because of how we're looking at additionality. But my argument being is that on my farm, because I have the biology now rocking and rolling, and because we're so far into adopting these practices that our flywheel is spinning and we are there and we are really cranking and we're seeing it and we're seeing it in the soil and we are getting the results from it. I don't necessarily need to go into these markets for additional dollars. That's not the, that's not the driver for us. Uh, the practices themselves and our, our understanding of our own data um, drive the profitability for our own farm. But I want to be able to showcase how our farm can be part of the solution. And today we don't qualify to even be part of helping these companies to meet their goals. And I, I just think that's inherently flawed. 
Great. Thank you. Um, what was our Kim, half? Well, the second half, I, th I think you got into, but anything, no, get anything else you want to add about kind of the level of data that some of the markets are requiring for proof, whether that be in inputs, activities, or invoices? Any, anything so, else? So much, so much of that stuff, you know, I don't think the data – collecting the data is not going to be that terrible crazy the issue today is that it's just in lots of different buckets okay so it's just spread out so that's where with top so we're trying to integrate with a wide array of those platforms and utilize like take a picture and upload the photo so i could take a picture from where i'm at here today upload it to topsoil and it uses my gps um my gps uh, geotag and my timestamp to be able to show hey i'm planting soybeans into cereal rye today. Very clear that the rye is green and growing. I'm planting green. It has not yet been terminated. Here's how much biomass I have um, and be able to document what I'm doing. Now, I'm also, of course, utilizing Precision Ag Tools. I will have an actual shape file as applied that I can also upload to Topsoil. Uh, we've got a variety of other tech and sensors and fun stuff that we're playing around with here today as well. Um, but farmers just need to a better understanding of what data actually has to be collected. Now, I think there's a lot of uncertainty on, wow, this is a lot of data that I have to share. How much of it is absolutely required? What format does it have to be shared in? How crazy in depth does this need to be? And how close do I need to be in these claims, especially as we're looking back 10 years or more, there is a, uh, there's a lot of runaround that farmers have to do once they get into it and we better understand, okay, here's the, you know, 27 different items that you have to collect every year. Well, now they can collect it throughout the year, really reduce that burden, spread it out over time and make it a lot easier. But uh, at the beginning, there's a lot of heavy lifting that's got to be done. Terrific. Thanks for that, that color there. Kim Wagner asks, are you working with any farmers in perennial crops? Um, so we've got a little bit of it. I mean, my area here, you know, in the Midwest, definitely, definitely a lot on the, on the row crop side of things for sure. Um, some of my guys in South Africa, uh, very heavily focused on perennial crops. Um, my first customers in 2015 were actually in South Africa and, uh, we were working on some, uh, plums and other citrus and stuff down there. So, so that's been kind of fun. Uh, we do have some, um, some perennial stuff going on up in Michigan, um, some vegetable type stuff down in Florida, uh, just a wide array. You know, for me, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one that's able to really provide the specific know-how, the specific final details for all those different states and all those different crops and stuff. What I want to do is, is enable that local consultant that is an expert on perennials. So they are an expert on, you know, in a vineyard situation or whatever it may be, um, or hemp or whatever. I want to utilize that local trusted advisor, that local resource, and just better equip them with soil health data tools and now sustainability connectivity data tools. They are the expert already. I do not need to be the expert on all this stuff. I do not need to attempt to hire all the people to be experts on all these nuances. We need to really utilize those relationships that are already existing in agriculture and just better equip them with data so that they can continue to make better decisions and move their operation forward. So I try to connect people with the right resources as much as I can. Uh, at Continuum Ag, we call ourselves the catalyst for sustainable agriculture. That's a huge thing of what I do. You know, I try to provide my insights and my thoughts and utilize the scalable tech to provide the, the data as much as we can, and then connect people with those local resources and, and allow for the, that local innovation to really flourish. Great. Thank you. And Kim, thank you for the question. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Good to see you here. Um, great. Well, Mitchell, one, one last question I had was just kind of walk me through how you see the next 12 months. You would love to get kind of the, the uh, medium term milestones you're seeking. Um, yeah. You, you know, you're coming up with a round of funding. Where, where do you see Continuum Ag in 12, 12 months? No, great question. So uh, right now we're building a, a profile system within topsoil. So I mentioned, you know, being able to get the onboarding from 60 hours to 60 minutes. And uh, what we're doing is building a, a very easy onboarding farmer profile type system. Uh, so that'll be launched here. It looks like uh, yet in the month of May, that'll go live. Really helping a farmer to be able to collect all of that data, 
talking about here's how I manage my corn, here's how I manage my soybeans, here's how I manage my other crops, make it really simple and scalable. So that's a big one. Uh, next is some of our scouting tools and stuff and other integrations. We already have all of our fertility recommendation stuff done. Our yield analytics type tools are done. Uh, a wide array of our APIs, but we'll continue to build the APIs, of course, pretty much in perpetuity. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on right now in the carbon space to better understand getting to the certainty ranges that we need. So we, we're getting a bunch of data back from the lab right now on our pilot projects, better understanding spatial variance, utilizing machine learning to understand the certainty that we are getting now in direct measurement of carbon. Now we'll go and implement the regenerative practices on these farms, fitting them into how we're quantifying addition or how we are defining additionality today. Um, and, and then coming back in the years to come to direct measure again, the carbon that we are sequestering. Another big thing that we'll build over within the next 12 months is more of our long-term 15 year model. Uh, we build a 15 year model for a large project uh, that we're working on to look at over the next 15 years, how do we take a farm from conventional to all the way to regenerative organic? And we built it all out with machine learning to understand all the different nuances of um, the income and expenses coming off the farm, a wide array of different crops, a wide array of different rotations, irrigated and non-irrigated. So now we know uh, we've ran a thousand different scenarios for this very large, very, very large farm uh, where we're looking at all of the different options for the expenses, all the options for our crop rotations, um, all of our expected yields and expected profitability, also modeling out our water impact, our carbon impact, um, and better understanding, basically taking a farm from the starting point of ground zero, wherever a farm is at today, plugging in the goal for this farm, the goal is regenerative organic. And now we have machine learning to help to paint a picture to fill in the gap of what is the best path forward, utilize machine learning to look at all the best case scenarios, the worst case scenarios, and be able to plan for the variability that we have within agriculture to really reduce the risk of change. Right now, that system is in an Excel file and uh, you know it's still pretty rough. Uh, the data and stuff going into it is, is incredible. And as a farmer, when I saw the results from it, I was like, holy crap, this is, this is game changer. Uh, so really excited to get that built in the topsoil so that those kind of solutions can be uh, rolled out at scale. I anticipate having that for the fall here so people can start making decisions for the 2022 growing season. Awesome. Well, Mitchell, thank you so much. Um, congrats on all the progress. And uh, thanks for being, um, thanks for making the time despite the, the field work you need to do. Uh, for those <laughs> in attendance, thank you all for joining us. As a reminder, we host these calls every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. Um, so we look forward to, to seeing you next week um, for a new and exciting presentation. And as a reminder, these are being recorded. So if you know of anyone who would like to hear uh, about Continuum Ag Services who may be interested, please do point them in our direction and they can sign up to uh, hear this recording. So thank you all again. Thank you, Mitchell. And I uh, hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me.